Everybody ready? Okay, I'll call the meeting to order at 6.01. Okay, um, we'll start out with announcements. Um, I'm not sure who's going to introduce Renee Norris, but I guess you? All right, since you hired her. So I'd like to introduce Renee Norris. She's our new Chief Financial Officer. Renee? Most of you have uh, met her, but if you haven't, she's a delightful person and very, very talented. We're lucky to have her. Welcome, Renee. We're glad to have you on board. Good. Okay, uh, Rachel. Good evening, everyone. It's odd for me to sit while I speak. I do a lot of public speaking. I usually stand, so bear with me. My name is Rachel Ikaza, and I am your education initiatives librarian for Sonoma County Library. A um, little bit of background on me. I'm a Sonoma County native. I've been here at the library for 14 years, and I am definitely doing my dream job. I love my work very much and our mission to share and integrate library resources in every single classroom one school at a time is my life's work, and it's really exciting to get to do this every day. And I use my native status to our benefit because it helps. Um, when I used to go to that school that's in your district, Mr. Superintendent or whatever, it, it comes in handy. So you've got my slides in front of you there. Just going to go briefly over. Oh, I'm going to back up a little bit. Um, this is kind of news from the good news desk. We have a lot of issues in our lives these days and in our community, and um, this report is really to share with you some of the very exciting good news that is happening out in our schools. So that's kind of to frame what we're doing. It's news from the good news desk. Um, one of the most exciting things that I get to do um, to integrate library resources into our schools is using partnerships and initiatives. And one of the most powerful partnerships that we have at the moment is called the Student One Card Partnership. So where do I? Where do I point it? Let's make sure we have it turned on. Technical difficulty. Oh, thank you. Awesome, thank you. All right. So the first, or actually the second slide that you may have in front of you is a map. Now this map comes from Sonoma County Office of Education, and each of those kind of squiggle cells is a school district with its boundaries. And colored in are the ones that have currently signed on to the official Memorandum of Understanding um, MOU with us for the Student One Card Partnership. And what that means, just to back up a little bit too, is in September of 2017, we started discussions about this. The commission approved the student one card and the educator card policy. So what you see on the map here are the districts that are currently active in our system running the student one card. In August of this year, we're launching six districts. So all six plus the current ones are represented on that map there. So you see Santa Rosa city limits, the blue and teal, those are the city limits districts. There are nine different school districts within the city limits of Santa Rosa. Two of those are kind of light teal, Mark West and Kenwood. Um, they've been invited to participate in the partnership. We haven't heard back from them despite a few um, reaching out to them. So we're just kind of wait and see what they want to do. And then um, basically the entirety of the Healdsburg area is, um, as of August, will be covered. So that's where we are um, as of August. In your next slide, we've got the timeline. So I mentioned September 2017, the commission approved the student one card and educator card policy. Then we move forward in January, launching that educator card. Um, it's, it's a special library card that allows us to really have a good reason to go to a school and say, hey, we'd like to meet with all of your faculty, give a little presentation about what library resources are, and make a special library account for every um, person on your staff who works with students. That one initiative has really taken the door off the hinges as far as getting into schools because the teachers really love special services and that one-on-one -on -one access to a, a librarian. 
Um, just running through the list, March of 2018, we launched the first school district for student one card. That Santa Rosa City Schools has roughly 17,000 students. That was our first one out the gate. And September of, or excuse me, on October, I'm going to back up. September, we launched Healdsburg. Then we launched the West Side School District, then Rincon Valley. And then between April and May, I got MOUs from all the districts listed there, and they will all launch in August. So where does that bring us as far as attendance or numbers of accounts? We're up to 30,784 student one card accounts by August. So we're about a quarter of the way there as far as the whole county. So we've got quite a bit of work to do. Um, here's some usage statistics for the current account. So that does not include the ones launching in August, obviously, because those students haven't had the chance to use their student one card. So this is limited to the accounts that already exist. So 4,660 physical items checked out with a student one card account. And then we have some data about our online usage. It's kind of tough for us to quantify exactly what library card types are using some of our online resources. Um, and we are one of 70 library systems statewide doing an initiative like this with their schools, and we are all struggling to gather this kind of data. Um, we're working on it, we'll get there, but at the moment this is what we have to show for these specific kinds of library accounts and the usage they're getting. Really exciting to see Tutor.com in particular um, before the Student One Card initiative launched, um, the average monthly usage for that resource was about 31 uh, tutor student interactions per month. In the past year, just in the last calendar year, the average monthly use is 148 interactions between a tutor and a student. Um, and goes as high as 254 interactions per month. So that's an average of almost 500% increase from before to after student one card. So just that one resource is a pretty clear window into this is working. What I would like to see is more physical items checked out and ongoing more relationships with our schools, which is really the, the heart and soul of this whole project. Um, onboarding more districts, how do we get to all 40. We have 40 districts in our county, and um, each one of them requires tender loving care and ongoing relationship building and maintenance. So between 2017 and 2019, we've got 10 districts signed on, two kind of pending, that's that Mark West School and Kenwood. If any of you has a contact there, I would love to hear it. I would love to get an email or some kind of card an email introduction would be really, really helpful um, to get us in the door. Phase two starts in September, and we are looking to add 14 districts and maintaining the 12 that we've already added on. So there is a kind of a natural organic flow to how this happens, and a lot of that is determined by the interests of the schools and the availability of our youth services librarians. Um, building relationships between the youth services staff children's and teen services librarians and the school district leadership and the school teachers and the parents and the students. It, it's all cruxed on those youth services librarians because they are definitely our superstars. Um, we create buy-in at every level in the district starting from the leadership teams, the superintendent, all the deans, the principals, through the schools, all the faculty, everybody who works with a student parent-teacher organizations, newcomer groups, which are a very important aspect of school community to make sure that all the newcomers to our area, be they Spanish-speaking or English-speaking or whatever language, that they all feel welcome at the library, um, building ongoing career-length relationships with educators at every level is a huge piece of this. Um, and part of how we deliver those relations and deliver on the relationships we're building is by classroom teaching with teachers, working on curriculum, delivering library instruction, all kinds of really exciting things that we can do, project-based learning experiences that we can provide to schools that they probably wouldn't have the bandwidth to do without us. So it's very exciting. 
um, but in order to move forward with more districts, we need to rely on our staff at our branches. We need to make sure that they're ready to deliver on those relationships, that they're ready to attend meetings and that they have the bandwidth in their time to do all this work. So working between them, our IT staff, graphics, there's a whole team that's put together to make this partnership go, and it takes a village for sure. Um, and in the end, the goals of this project, on your last slide, is stronger relationships between the library and schools, becoming kind of ubiquitous in the schools and say, obviously, we're going to have librarians at our technology evening. Obviously, we want you for Read Across America Day. We have a guest librarian reading to the kids. Obviously, we um, look forward to your SAT and ACT test prep classes. It's just of course, it's ubiquitous. We're not there quite yet everywhere, and we want to be there. Um, we definitely, top of our list is students achieving greater success in school. That's a huge priority for us. It's a priority for the districts, and we want to definitely work in alignment on that. Um, and then reinforcing that the library has a role in education in our community to kind of elevate the role of the librarian in the school community and the greater community that we touch so many folks in the education world and have a place at that table and cluing in education leaders that we should be at that table. So it's an exciting place to be. That's the end of my slides. Um, I see there's a question maybe. Yeah, I have two questions actually. One, two questions. Please use your microphone. I usually have a wow, voice, I don't need this. Uh, two questions. When you say, is it K through 12, I take it? Correct, K through 12. Okay, and then, so by August we're gonna have 30,000 students. Yes. It, my understanding is the local libraries are gonna do the heavy lifting, the teen and youth services. The youth services and the, ju the children's librarians um, building relationships between the school and the library, yes. And typically that's what, one at each library? Um, it depends on the branch. Uh, some locations like Petaluma, for example, have uh, two full-time children's librarians, one half-time, and currently a half-time teen services librarian. Um, Roner Park has two full-time children's librarians and a half-time teen services librarian. So the, sh the staffing on that varies by location. By population size, I imagine, per, with, with the, where the library is located? I don't know. Was that, what I'm looking at is there's gonna be a three-fold, you guys were anticipating over a three-fold increase which would be roughly 100,000 students. Mm -hmm. There uh, are 157,000 enrolled students in this county. And if we get to the anticipated use, are we adequately staffed? That's, that's an ongoing discussion. I'm, I'm not really qualified to answer that particularly. Um, because we don't want to start a, a program of this magnitude if it's well used and then be understaffed to, to provide the nice, services that we're promising. Right. The, the thing to think about too is um, it's a long game plan. This is, this is a long game look at how do we create long standing relationships with our schools and it starts with um, having a librarian who, who can go and visit or a school leader who has the interest to respond to our, our invitation to participate. Um, so that's part of why we don't just blanket ask the entire county of, of school leaders to say, hey, anyone want to do this? To say, no, we're going to pace it. We're going to be re respectful of all of our resources and make sure it's going to be effective when we get there. We don't necessarily go towards a district in a service area that isn't quite ready. Um, and that's a conversation between um, myself, Kathy DeWeese, and the staff at the library to make sure that everybody's feeling comfortable and, and going forward with intentionality and power and not just like, oh, I think I can go and maybe we can do one or two classrooms. Like, that's not really the goal. It's to make sure that you feel really confident and able to go out there and meet the need that is there. Thank you. Another question? I was thinking about what she was saying. Okay, Barbara. Thank you, Rachel. I think this is fantastic. I'm sure we all do. This is, you know, essential to our mission as a library. Uh, you and I had this brief conversation about Rona Park Katati School, Katati Rona Park School District this afternoon. And so from what I'm hearing you say right now is it kind of, you almost like you need a champion, right? You need a champion in each school district to, kind of sell it with, within, and then 
and I'm, I'm kind of responding to your word about bandwidth. The bandwidth comes from the library side, as Jason was, was pointing out. So we're convinced by the time, like we want to talk to Katati Runner Park School District, that we have the librarians in, uh, you know, in our branch to go out and be the presence in the, in the mm -hmm. school district, right? And I, just as a follow-up, you were talking about the stronger relationships between the library and schools. Kind of what does that look like? What does the relationship look like? Well, no, what does it look like to you to meet this goal of a stronger relationship with the schools? I think it comes from building relationships to, to create champions at the school district. Um, you mentioned the top of your question that do I need a champion at each district to, to help sell it? And not necessarily, but we do need somebody at a leadership level to take somewhat of an interest to at least take a meeting. Um, I think that long term will, through the organic processes of relationship building at the schools, you kind of, you, somebody will take an interest. You, you get the chance to present to a leadership meeting or to a school board meeting and somebody says, oh, I love the library. My grandson and my daughter use it every week and let me, here's my card and like let's roll with that. You know, these things kind of come up organically. They have so far and that feels like a good way to do this. But some places where I've tried or the local branch staff have tried to initiate relationships over the years and it's been met with a little bit lackluster. If we have somebody in our community like you all or anyone else that you might know that says, oh yeah, they're a library fan, let's get you connected. Sometimes that can make all the difference. But on an ongoing basis, we know that we have a successful relationship when you were kind of making some examples like anytime there was something library-ish involved mm -hmm. that we had somebody there on campus or Right. Somebody from campus had somebody at our library. Right. Both ways, right? Yes. Thank you. Stephen? So I missed, I missed, and I think a few of us missed, the number of full-time students enrolled is what number? Um, it's on your slides, and I'm happy to re say it again. It's um, by August of this no, year. No, no, no. I'm not talking about that number. I'm talking about the overall number. The enrollment? Enrolled. Yes. Uh, it's about 157,000 okay. students. I, I got to say that I'm, I'm appreciative of the report, but I'm very concerned about where we are on our timeline because as far as our overall goal and mission of being good partners, it seems like there is no better partner with struggling school districts than the library. So I kind of want to know from you more details about why when you've reached out to various people in the school districts, they said no. And I have a feeling it has something to do with confidentiality and their concerns because you mentioned on page 10 that everybody has to sign on to the FERPA. I honestly don't know, like, the, and it also says that staff has to do mandatory Sonoma County Library confidentiality, confidentiality policy training annually. I don't know what that is myself. Um, is that the concern that you're getting from school districts? I cannot understand. I know we went around and around on this. We're getting on Roseland. Roseland's finally there. I can't see any principal or superintendent saying no to this program. So what concrete reasons have you heard for their not wanting to engage with this? I've heard silence. I have not heard anyone say, no, thank you. It's been nothing. So with Roseland is a perfect example. We approached them a while back and they had some concerns and we said, okay, let, we, we have some learning to do and we'll um, pitch this a certain way to Santa Rosa City Schools and see what their response is. And they were willing to make a few adjustments and move forward. Long story short, you fast forward to now and the document that Roseland District helped us prepare is now the gold standard for every other district that will receive that document. It is so thoroughly vetted. It is such a, a wonderful blueprint for success here that I can send that to a district and know that they really, there's not much they could object to that couldn't be figured out with a conversation. Districts that have been invited that we haven't onboarded yet just haven't responded. And what that means is you, I sent an initial pitch email with a bunch of documents that's followed up by a phone call to the executive secretary to saying, hey, my name's Rachel. I sent out this email. Just want to make sure you receive that. They say yes. And then I say, Would, please have a look at it and, and get back to me. Open-ended, open hands. And then 
I maybe don't get anything. About three weeks later, I send another email, the same exact one. I call. I say, hey, I just, you know, just in case it kind of fell through the cracks, I sent you another uh, pitch email with all the documentation. Do you have a chance to look at it? Oh, the superintendent's been busy or um, it's on the back burner. We've got some other issues. Okay, thank you. And moving on. Um, we've I've had plenty of good response, like um, Bennett Valley, for example. Bennett Valley is a school district. 15 minutes, I sent the email. 15 minutes, I got a call from the superintendent herself. When can you be here? I'm going to have my secretary get on the line, and we're going to make it in a meeting. So it just really depends. And I'm actually kind of grateful for that there's a natural, organic pace to some of this, because it's going to be by people that want to do this. I don't want to shove it down anyone's throat. I don't want to push it on a district that's really like, we've got other issues right now. I don't want to go on and on. It just, does that answer your question? Okay. Okay. Um, Karen? And it would be my guess that this program, as it gains critical mass, that, this, that other schools might be more interested. Nobody wants to be the one school in the county not Absolutely. doing this. Absolutely. When or excuse me, when Rincon Valley um, understood that Santa Rosa City Schools was already signed on, they're like, we don't want to be left in the dust on this. So they were very quick to sign on. Okay, Andy. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for sharing the successes you've had so far. I had a couple of questions. One, uh, maybe as a, an initial marketing question, and I apologize because I was not here when the program was initially conceived, but in your outreach to prospective school district partners, what is the um, underlying need or problem that you put forward as the reason for this program and the consequent benefit that they would receive by participating in it. The pitch email is not phrased exactly in that way as you have a problem, I have an answer, though that is a great way to, to discuss the, the notion of this partnership and what a formal agreement between us could do for a district. Mostly what what I try to say in very few words, because you know nobody reads below the fold. They're not going to scroll down, so it has to be brief, is something in the realm of um, we want to make sure that every student in our county has access to the same material, that it's easy, convenient for families, that it is um, without barriers. And kind of going on the hoping that the recipient of this email will understand the value of the library because I have such a few, sh such a short amount of time to get them even interested. So that's why I kind of follow up with a phone call. But it's a very brief email. The documents attached are our privacy policy, um, a promotional flyer that's pre-made by our graphics department so they can see what this would look like going home to families, an opt-out form, and I know I'm missing something. It's just, a, it's like five documents that we usually send. Oh, there's a, a sheet that says the exact um, data that we need from the school because it is a data upload. Um, Mr. Zolman mentioned that it, the concern may be about privacy, and we really figured out how to talk about the privacy issue and our process is that we don't collect personal information about the students, so the districts are not worried about it really anymore. The, the issues that we had before when we were collecting personal information, we we're not doing that, so it's much easier. Does that answer your question? Well, um, yeah, and I um, uh, I realize that, not one, that there's not one thing that's going to work with everybody, and I don't know how closely you worked with the communications team here, but it, it seems like capturing attention by pointing to an issue, need, or problem, and a great solution in a compelling way would help with the first step. I guess my second question, and then I'll, I'll yield, is once you have established a relationship, could you talk a little bit about what we do to further this and make sure that people actually are taking advantage of it? I, 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 I saw we have 30,000 students, but we had less than 5,000 items checked out, and that was not encouraging to me. I agree. and. 
<clears throat> our metrics for success on this as far as um, checkouts, it's kind of hard to say because so much of this is done digitally, and that is frustrating, and, and we're working on ways to parse that data out. Um, the real exciting thing about all this work, in my mind, is the relationship building between our librarians and our teachers. Being able to uh, be invited to go to a school like Read Across America Day, have a guest librarian read to the kids, and then be asked back or say, hey, I'm having this event at the library. I'd love for your school to come and meet this author who we're having at the library, or we've got a special musical program at the library. Bring your classroom. Like Those kinds of things, those relationship building pieces are really important and really impact long-term relationships where the teachers, as they're developing curricula, they will look at our collections and see, oh, maybe they don't own a book about that topic. Or, hey, I know somebody in collections at the library who can maybe help us find a great title. The, re the reality of our school district systems in the whole county is there are nine certified media teachers in our entire environment, nine. So that, that professional has a master's in library science, a master's in education, and a teaching credential. They are more qualified than I am to be in a school library. We have nine such people in our whole 157,000 students. So what our librarians do is it, we can't possibly do exactly what a teacher librarian does, but we have plenty of wonderful things that we would love to do with our teachers that we are doing with our teachers, with the school communities. Um, I'd like to highlight the work of Charity Anderson at the Hillsburg Library in particular. The work that she's been doing for eight years up there just greased the wheels like crazy to get into those districts. It was like lightning because she has been working closely with those schools, with those education leaders for years. And not every branch has been able to do that. We maybe had turnover for whatever reason. It just, some, sometimes it works out and sometimes they need a little help. And that's my job is to start opening those doors. So I, I'll just make one final comment and, and stop. I, what it sounds like is that while it's difficult to track statistics, you're starting to get a fair number of anecdotal successes, and I would encourage you to document and you know publish those to share them because sometimes a compelling story about a particular project where a teacher partnered with a library or where the kids went to, to hear an author can can be more meaningful than just the numbers, and that's my last comment. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Great report from the Good News Department. We're very delighted, um, and and actually, uh, I think that we could be of service, and probably the friends in all the communities could be of service because you all are busy doing the work, um, but we can talk about it a little more than you can, and we can celebrate it, and we can, in fact, brag about it. And so it, uh, I think don't, don't forget that, that the civilians who support the library would love to have something to brag about like this. And so um, I echo the notion of capturing some of those stories, um, and then, um, you know, people might want to write a check to the library to encourage this kind of behavior as well. So this, this, I also noted that, um, that it says that the uh, fiscal impact, there's no fiscal impact of this program. And uh, I think in short term, perhaps, but in the long term, this can have an enormous positive physical, fiscal impact. So, and, and people like us can help you do that. So don't forget that we're here. When I go speak to a school board, I may call you and have you come be my partner Please in crime. Please do. We yeah. all would be delighted to do those kinds of things. That's great. Thank you. Barbara? One quick comment and one quick suggestion. The comment is um, that based on your information here, we're going to have 30,000 students by August, but we this checkout number of 4660 is not th based on 30,000 students. That's based more like on what? 21,000. Yeah. So it's less bad. <laughs> and the, my suggestion would be if, uh, and I just heard Deborah mention school boards, I don't know if you've actually gone before a school board, but just yes. like us, you go down, if you can't get anybody to answer at the superintendent's office, to go down to actually a school board meeting, take some of these great flyers, pass them out, and give them to each school board member, start the 
the excitement, you know, from them, let them pressure the superintendent. And if you can't get it from the superintendent's office, it's very effective. I, think. I considered going down that route with one district and ended up getting in touch with the superintendent and ran that idea by them. And they said it's that might work, but working with the superintendent so that I don't want to catch them out and they're sitting there being like, oh, I, I don't remember hearing it, you know. But well, I will remember that idea. Any other questions? Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Rachel. Thank very you. Very nice report. Thank you. And I also would like to thank you for the work you did at the Pride Festival. I want to say it to your face, not to some <laughs> another one. But thank you. You're welcome. Both. It was wonderful. Great event. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other announcements? Okay. Moving on, public appearances. Any public appearances? Nope. Okay. We are moving into closed session and uh, we will be back ASAP. Call the meeting back to order. Uh, there was no reportable action taken in closed session. So we'll, we'll move on to lab appointments. I don't believe there were any lab appointments. Yep, six is pumped. Okay, so we're going to have a presentation by the Sarah Ortiz, who's president of the Sonoma County Public Library Foundation. Hello, Commission. Um, I don't have a prepared PowerPoint. I just came. I wanted to introduce myself. Um, I'm newly elected as of January um, of the Sonoma County Public Library Foundation, and I haven't met several of you. Several of you I have, and uh, I want to thank you. Um, I know uh, Commissioner Foxen and Commissioner Doyle and Commissioner McKenzie were at our recent event, Books and Brews, and I want to thank you for your support. And I'm sorry. <laughs> and Commissioner Zolman. And um, I have seen several other um, commissioners at various functions. And I just want to thank all of you for all the work you're doing for the library. Really appreciate it um, and spending your time here. Uh, I just wanted to give a re report out on what the foundation's been doing. Um, I know Commissioner Merrick's been keeping you guys updated, so I might not be sharing anything new. Most of the time when I'm talking about the library with different groups, um, I'm selling the library and saying all of the cool things that are happening at the library and how much I love the library. But here I'm among friends, and you all already love the library and know about the cool things happening at the library. So um, I don't have to share all of those things. <laughs> um, so recently in uh, 2019, um, the foundation has given $50,000 to digital literacy. Um, and I was just talking uh, with Vicki right here about how that's going to go out in August. The Chromebooks are going to roll out um, with the Wi-Fi hotspots, and kids will be able to use them um, on their way back to school. And that's really, really exciting. And um, I think the library is pushing forward into digital literacy in all different kinds of ways, and the foundation is excited to be a small slice of that. Um, we also gave $25,000 to the Library of Things. Uh, I haven't heard yet how that's being implemented, um, but we're excited about the new idea of what a library can be. A library is important as a physical place, but also about the resources and access it brings to the community, and um, the foundation is really excited about that. Um, we're also looking forward to the next round of staff innovation grants, which we encourage um, all library staff at every branch to apply to three times a year. Um, so we just closed uh, for June, and at our next meeting we'll be voting um, on approving those grants. Uh, I haven't seen them yet, but excited about what um, the library staff have thought up. Uh, many of you have already seen some of the staff innovation grants. For example, at Books and Brews, there was um, the blender bike, which is exactly what it sounds like. Uh, you get on a bike and it blends. Anne is an expert. Um, and um, that'll be used as an outreach tool. Um, I think it 
it might live at the Sebastopol Library, but it's being used by all the libraries, um, especially over the summertime at farmers markets and things like that to draw people in. And so um, we can tell more people about how great the library is. Um, also at Books and Brews, and it lives at the Central Library, is the electric piano, um, which can be used by anybody, and uh, people can sign up to use it. And um, I talked to the head librarian, Kate, and she says that people absolutely love it, and there are several people who are perhaps unsheltered, and they come in, and they get to play the piano and get to have music in their life, and it's really beautiful. And um, this is just my personal interest, but how cool would it be to have like an orchestra of a library and a different instrument at every branch. So I encourage library staff to apply for whatever grants they can think up. Um, if they have an electric drum, drum kit, my husband will go play it. So, um, And I thought I would tell you guys a little bit about what the foundation does, because I think with so many groups supporting the library, and we all love the library, um, there's a little confusion even among us about what we do. And so... The foundation really supports the library um, in a small slice, and we're hoping to grow, um, in three ways, uh, with current programming, with innovations, and with capital campaigns. And so the first way, um, uh, current programming. So the library comes to us and asks us for donations for a specific project that's ongoing, like summer reading, and we support it. So for example, last year, uh, we gave, I think, $75,000 for summer reading, um, and that went specifically towards expanding children and teen programming and giving teens free books. Um, in innovations, uh, we fund the staff innovation grant, we funded the digital literacy, as I said, and we were really excited about um, pushing the library forward as the library is doing an amazing job at expanding the capabilities and the thought of what a library can be. Um, and then capital campaigns. Um, Rosen Library looms large in all of our minds, and we're huge supporters of the Rosen Library, but also we understand there will be more opportunities in the future for further projects, you know. Um, it's not just the Rosen Library, although that is a huge focus. Um, every branch will need improvements or expansions or, you know, perhaps in the future we'll need a new library um, in a new community that will have a need. So we are open to that as well. And I'm here because I'm really interested in increasing the capacity of the foundation, and part of that is building bridges with the commission and the library staff and um, getting to know everybody a little bit better. And so I encourage you all, uh, I've met with several of you privately, feel free to email me, call me, um, and we can meet up. I'd be happy to do so. Um, ways we're increasing the capacity of the foundation, um, first and foremost through visibility. People can't donate to us or to the um, library in general if they don't know that we exist and that we're asking. And so part of that is just doing outreach, a lot of outreach and connections and um, trying to make those connections. And so, for example, attending events like the recent Lo Cien luncheon, um, I spoke at Go Local, uh, reaching out to elected officials to invite them to our events, um, working with library staff. I really appreciate Ray Holly, who's taken me to the Kiwanis Club and things like that, um, and just building those connections. Uh, for example, I recently met with Sonoma County Tourism and um, hooked them up with Catherine Reinhardt at the History and Genealogy Museum. Um, they were like, why would anybody travel to go to a library. I was like, oh, you are missing an opportunity, especially with history and genealogy. Um, there's so many people who will travel directly to one place because they have certain documents or things. And so now there's a link on the Sonoma County Tourism website uh, directing them to the History and Genealogy Museum. And so I see um, my work is partly just to raise the visibility and make those connections. Um, Part of that is having events. Uh, events make money, but also really just increase our visibility again. And so some of you were at Books and Brews. Thank you again. Um, and we sold 60 tickets, which are for our first event. We were pretty excited. Uh, we had several people, a lot of people actually buy tickets in support, but they unfortunately weren't able to come. We had several elected officials um, buy tickets. We were very happy. And so we plan to continue and take what we learned and um, transform it into an even better event. Um, We'll have Chocolate and Cinema, which is our long-standing event, coming up August 22nd. It'll be Some Like It Hot, the Marilyn Monroe movie at the Rialto Theaters in Sebastopol. Um, and that'll be live on our website next week. Um, a lot of our donors really look forward to that because it's a fun event. Um, and 
other ways that we're increasing our capacity is growing our board. So I welcome suggestions. If you have anybody that would like to join the foundation or would like to help in any way, you can always direct them my way. I'm happy to talk to them about what they can do. And it doesn't necessarily mean having to be a full-time board member, although that's a pretty low time commitment. Um, it could just mean volunteering at an event or working on a special project or anything like that. Um, and so I'm really looking towards the future. Um, recently, the foundation met to talk about, uh, as a retreat, um, to talk about our strategic vision and our mission, why we exist, how we complete our goals, and thing, something that came up again and again for us was equity. And so we're coming up with a new mission statement to reflect that because it's interesting that it resonated so strongly with several of our members, and yet it's not on our website or in our mission statement. Um, for me personally, that is why um, I volunteer my time. I strongly believe that libraries build equity in communities and that they're important and a foundation to our democracy. You can't vote if you can't read. Um, and I'm looking forward to the new development person who will be hired by the library. Thank you for approving that. And I look forward to working with them and expanding our capacity into things that we historically haven't done, but look forward to doing, such as grant writing, corporate sponsorships, um, increasing our both current donors and new donors. And so um, finally, I just want to say thank you for everything you're doing. And I look forward to partnering with the library staff, the commission, and even the friends groups. Um, I got to meet several friends at the recent uh, friends strategic planning uh, meeting, and that was an absolutely wonderful experience, and I think there's opportunities there as well. So, thank you. Okay, uh, Stephen, we'll start with you. Well, first, thank you. Thank you for everything that you do, and thanks for your inaugural kickoff, the um, bruise thing. It was awesome. Lots of good energy. Um, you sort of addressed um, my thought of like how any of us commissioners could plug in and this, this strategic plan that you mentioned, do you know when that might be sort of available for public view and, and if it is going to be, will you post it somewhere like on your website so that we can read it and then figure out where we can really tap in or provide referrals and that, that type of thing? Absolutely, yes. Um, I am on a personal mission to update and um, hopefully get a whole new website because it's not super user-friendly at the moment. Um, that's just my personal. Um, but it, even if we stay with the same website, we will definitely update it with current information. And um, we're going to be circulating a mission statement that all of our board members can kind of tweak and we can go over. Um, and I think in the next two board re meetings, uh, we'll give ourselves time to talk about it. So by the fall, hopefully we'll have a really concrete mission statement and maybe even a strategic plan. Um, we've definitely been talking. Um, we want to expand our goals and our fundraising capacity, and with that takes a lot of planning. And so we've been working on that. Okay. Barbara? Yes, hi. I, too, wanted to thank you. Thanks for coming down here and your, and your detailed report. Appreciate it. And appreciate all, the founda all that the foundation does for the library. I had one specific question, which is this old issue of the mobile van. And I wonder if you could just kind of clarify for the record the situation with the, the bookmobile is what I meant, the bookmobile. Sure. Um, the bookmobile has applied for um, IRS designation as its own 501c3, and it has heard back from the IRS just, I think, this week or last week, very recently. Um, and so the process isn't complete, but it is started, and definitely by the end of this year, this calendar year, um, the bookmobile will be its own. 501c3, barring any emergencies or unforeseen circumstances. So currently the foundation acts as a fiduciary, right? Is Cur that what you're saying when it becomes its own 501c3? Just maybe a little clarification on what the 501c3 application is going to do. Currently the bookmobile operates as a program of the foundation, um, and once it has its own designation as its own nonprofit, it'll we will wish them on their merry way, and you know uh, they do wonderful work, and they will do wonderful work, but not as part of the Sonoma County Public Library Foundation. 
Hi, may I uh, ask if you could speak a little closer to the microphone? Oh, sure, sorry. Bring it to you. Oh. Don't speak into these things often. Okay, Stephen. Yes, thank you, Commissioner McGenzie, for bringing that up. So once it becomes its own 501c3, what's going to be on the outside of this bookmobile? What what trademark? What's it going to say? At that point, he, uh, the bookmobile will no longer have the Sonoma County Public Library Foundation logo on it. Right, but I'm asking, if do you know what's supposed to be on the logo on the outside of the van? How are they going to be holding themselves out to the community? Do you know? I do not. Um, I. This is my assumption that it will say bookmobile as it currently does. The it, I believe it says the free bookmobile of Sonoma County. Any other questions? All righty. Thank you, Sarah, very much. Appreciate your coming. Thank you. Okay, uh, Commission and Liaison Reports, um, start with the Chair. Um, I want to thank San City of Santa Rosa and put it on record um, for the 150000 that they have contributed to the Roseland budget. Um, it's extremely important and it's a good start for the future for Roseland. By the way, I, I drove by it for the first time in the daylight as a great building. I always thought it was nice, but I'd always seen it in the dark, and I finally saw it in the light, and it was wonderful. Um, Ann and I met with Sarah Gurney to talk about uh, the library in Sebastopol, and it was really fabulous because she had a meeting in a parking lot of the complex there, which includes the senior center, the library, and the city hall, and it was a, an incredible way to really begin to start creating a true partnership around the facilities of that city, and including the library in that process was a marvelous step in that partnership. So I think that was cool. Um, Locien Luncheon. Lana was on the pedestal, or on, on the pedestal, on the dais, and she was fabulous. But even more, it was great to hear different people from that community talk about the challenges that they have and um, some different ways that they want to move forward and different things they're going to do. And I also want to continue my thank you that I'd started with Rachel because Rachel, Kim, Jane, Simone, Bridget, Connie, Joy, and Cammie were present at the Santa Rosa Pride, and that was the 50th year celebration of Stonewall. A lot of progress has been made, but what was the most fabulous about it was I thought they affirmed life for some people and opened the world to others, and I just think the library did a marvelous thing in doing that, and I like their little buttons, too. So, okay, that's my report. Um, Stephen, do you want to start? I seem to be starting with you all tonight. Thank you. Um, yes, my report's in the packet, and thanks for referencing the meeting um, with two of the Sebastopol Council people, and thank you for coming out, Maurice and Anne, as well. Um, it was a great discussion about how the library could be literally the heart. It's in our mission statement on our website. It's discussed as the hub. This one really would be in the heart of the community, and it would make good use of three square blocks that the city of Sebastopol owns. Um, it also then brought up the discussion about financing um, and capital fundraising, which I reported in my report um, that the city of Sebastopol is um, reaching out to try to figure out how to do a bond, um, its own city bond, but then also working with other jurisdictions to talk about doing a countywide bond to help all of our buildings because all of our buildings need more space and a lot of them are running ragged on years. So I thought it was a good discussion. That's it. Randall? <clears throat> I attended the um, author event last Monday, uh, Jason Lanier, who's a crazy visionary futurist guy, 
at Rincon Valley. Uh, I also wanted to announce that the Windsor Lab meeting will be Tuesday, July the 9th, and the rest of it's in my packet. Okay, Karen. My report is in the packet, but I'd like to say I'm excited about the Roseland new location, which I'll be able to walk to. And I'm also excited about the uh, progress with the hot spots. I understand there was a peak day of uh, 350 checked out, which might make it the most single-use item in the, in the system. So congratulations. Deborah. My report is also in the packet. Um, I would say that I was supposed to go to the American Library Association conference and had an illness in the family, so I was unable to go. But I was scheduled for a pre-conference that um, talked about what libraries do when uh, disaster happens. And so I um, spoke to the person who was organizing the conference, and uh, she's sending me the information that actually was produced for the, um, for the information. I'm sure that you all probably know how to, um, how to handle a library that's on fire and flooding, but, but I thought that there might be some interesting, interesting news that I could come away with, so I'll share it when I get it. Thank you. Hey, Andy? As I think many of you know, I was away for most of the last month and so did not include a written report, but I will just mention that right before I left on a Monday, May 19th, uh, I had an opportunity in the public comments section of the meeting to present very briefly to the Hillsburg City Council. And uh, obviously we have a lot to share and they were excited to hear about it. I had a very positive re reaction and it was, a, it was an interesting experience which I will share with uh, the commissioners uh, at a later date, but three minutes is not a long time if you have a lot to share. That's all I will, I will say, thank you. Okay, Barbara. Yes, thank you. My report is in the packet, page 12 and 13 and 14. I included some photos of uh, actually the Mayor's Council Members Association, the Books and Brews, and uh, a great outreach table that we had at the library. In particular, I just want to say two things. The outreach table we had at the first farmer's market around at Park was absolutely fabulous. We had so many people and we checked out a um, Wi-Fi hotspot and we checked out some of those, um, I always say the wrong word, what playaways, right? and got so much interest that people were going right in the library and borrowing those things right after they talked to us. So it was really, I felt like the most worthwhile outreach I'd, I'd ever done. Um, secondly, this brilliant idea that Reese had about having the Mayors and Council Members Association at our headquarters, which just tied perfectly into the fact that Roner Park, the city, was supposed to host the event. and. The day we had this conversation, the very next day, the city of Roanoke Park staff came over, and you should have seen what that conference room looked like. It was covered in plastic, and there was none of the technology was there. And in a very short period of time, it was probably three weeks or less, it was completely transformed. I really want to thank Vicki and her staff who made that happen. It was just miraculous. Jaylene, for all of her coordination that she did with the city of Roanoke Park, pulling those things together was just, it was really impressive. And I'm not sure the gentleman's name who planted the flowers out by the flagpole, thank you very much, because it looked a lot better. And the clean windows. Anyway, all the work that all the staff put in there, it was so impressive. I was so proud of everybody. And the impact, uh, I think most of the mayors were there. Many, many of the city council people were there. Many city managers were there. I mean, this is exactly the kind of thing that we need to do to remember our jurisdictional partners uh, as we move forward. So that's a huge step. And thank you, everybody who was involved in that. It was tremendous. Jason. Yeah, my uh, report's in the packet. I've been gone a lot over uh, the last month, a month and a half. Um, but I was able to fit in a meeting um, with our senior citizen community in Katati. Um, I got a lot of feedback uh, overall on the library system and what's their um, kind of needs. Um, and then um, I think the mobile van I put in my 
my report. Um, I've also sent it to the library, where I think it can best benefit um, our number one um, targeted population, Katadi, as far as the mobile van. And I think that could be really a big boon to that population. Um, I was just reading in this, so there's that. I was just reading in this neat little cards that were put on our desk that the library provides lunches during the summer um, at eight branches, and I think that's amazing. Um, I thought, uh, so again, just more services that the library provides beyond books. Um, and then lastly, I will be, uh, along with, unofficially with the lab, because we didn't have quorum at our last lab, but I will be, um, along with library staff and um, members of lab, the lab at the Rona Park Katadi Library, um, the Katadi Kids Day event coming up July 13th. So if anybody wants, uh, has kids and wants to come by, Katadi will be having a Kids Day event on July 13th. All righty, Paul. Well, I presented to, to the Petaluma City Council on the 17th and um, I have to say the council is very supportive as the community. And uh, I ended up uh, talking for about 15 minutes and um, nobody cut me off, so I continued talking, so that was good. And at the end, uh, there was a pretty good crowd there. They applauded. I don't know if they applauded because I did a good job or if they applauded that I was finally finished. But uh, anyway, so that, that was really, um, it was good for the community, and um, again, the, the uh, city council was really supporting the Petaluma Library there. Uh, let's see, I attended the advocacy meeting uh, last month, and I will be attending the lab next week, the Petaluma lab, so. No report. Yeah. My report's in the packet. I would just like to know two landmark events, one a true landmark. We now have a lease for our new Rosen branch, thanks to city council and everybody else. Um, and secondly, today is uh, our fine free library beginning, our launch. And I think this is a great thing for the citizens and will be long remembered. All righty. Um, I made a presentation to the Cloverdale City Council and mentioned the visitation of the UN and the hot spots and the uh, fines eliminate, elimination, and they were ecstatic. But what was really cool was the next night was the mayor's and council meeting, and two or three of our representatives came to that, and they were so blown away after hearing my report and then coming and seeing what was behind all the stuff that is being done in the libraries. They were just, I mean, they said, I never thought of it, and I can't believe it, and now I understand a little more of what you as a commissioner, what the people at the library do to make everything function, and they were excited. So that was really good. Okay. Um, moving on to the committee reports. Start with the director's evaluation. Um, Barbara McKenzie, Karen Schneider, and I met with Ann Hammond uh, a couple weeks ago, June 14th, and um, had a very, very good, informal, relaxed conversation, came away with a good sense of who Ann Hammond is as a person, who she is as a director. She talked about, you know, what she had learned uh, about the system itself, we talked about the successes and challenges that she's seen over the last three months, um, possible growth paths, uh, what she sees as things that we can do. And we have another meeting scheduled uh, this month uh, to talk about specific goals. And so at the next meeting, we will have a full report and with goals listed, et cetera, at this point in time. And this is the first director's evaluation she had. We plan on having another one in three or four months and then a full evaluation in a year. So thank you. Okay, finance, Randall. Um, the finance committee minutes are, is in the report. I don't have anything to add to that. Okay, uh, advocacy. Same with advocacy, it's in the, report. It's in the packet. Uh, Stephen. 
wanted to back up and thank the folks on the Finance Committee, and especially every time I read in the report that you guys are going back through and trying to figure out what exactly was bought with the Measure Y and the dollar amount associated with that, because it's very important. So I just really want to applaud your efforts to try to keep getting that nailed down, because the renewal's coming up, many of us get questioned, and I really want to know specifically what we bought and what the price tag is, so thank you. Okay, thank you, Stephen. Um, Jason, Foundation Liaison. Yes, I did go to the Foundation report, our uh, meeting. I got my, um, my report in late. It's all in front of the commissioner's um, desk or their uh, dais here. But um, everything regarding I had just basically put in the library report, um, which everybody knows, the new lease, which I greatly applaud for a temporary Roseland library. Uh, it's a six-year lease. Um, but most of this is library issues. What I do want to highlight and put in the record is what I got from the, the board president, Sarah, who we just uh, spoke with or who just presented. Um, she did attend the library strategy seminar for Friends of the Library. Um, so there was some, um, some uh, advancement there um, with library strategies. Uh, Books and Brews profited roughly $2,000, which is good for a brand new event um, that was put together by a, uh, you know, a new board. Uh, most of the board is all new together at the foundation, so I think that in relative terms was a success. Um, Let's see, the Chocolate and Cinemas is coming up, and that's going to be August 22nd. The movie will be Some Like It Hot, which I've never seen. I'm looking forward to seeing. Uh, tickets will be sold now for $35, um, and as I understand it, no tickets will be available at the door. So I uh, expect the event to sell out, so do get your tickets early. Um, there, they had a strategic meeting. There will be a rehash to go over what was um, learned from the strategic rehash about fundraising, events, and such. Um, there are going to be two appeal letters coming out from the foundation, in, uh, one in the summer, one in the winter. Basically, appeal letter is asking for donations. Um, but also, um, the foundation received a legacy fund donation that does ha did have some sticky legalities to it. Um, on behalf of the library. They're working through those legalities um, and assuming that does go through, um, then that, and a legacy fund is basically somebody passes and it's part of an estate that gets contributed to um, a uh, donor of choice or a, um, um, a agency or organization of choice. So assuming that goes through, uh, the donor will be mentioned in the Christmas appeal thanking them. That's about it. Okay. Measure Y, Randall. Uh, there's currently no meeting scheduled for the Measure Y committee. As soon as the results for the last fiscal year are available, they'll have a meeting to review those. All righty, thank you. Um, Roseland Coalition liaison, Stephen. Yes, um, I made every effort to try to attend the last Roseland Coalition meeting, however, with technical difficulties, which I'm really hoping get remedied between now and the next time so that those of us that have to call in or Skype in can do so. Um, as was mentioned several times by our chair and just by Commissioner Merrick, yes, great news um, about finally um, being able to celebrate the great partnership with the city of Santa Rosa and their one-time contribution. Um, a lot of the work we believe is still yet to be done um, because now we have the money. It's a matter of thinking through the partnerships and the services that we're going to be offering in this new location. Many um, entities have been identified, Sonoma State and all their graduate students, Makerspace. Um, there's been a lot of talk at the most recent um, Santa Rosa Resiliency uh, training, of which I am going through now as part of the second cohort. Um, as far as the needs in the Roseland community and how best to serve them. So it's a matter of thinking through strategically um, how to arrive at the best partnerships uh, for those services, um, but then also to make sure that we always keep and be mindful of the fact that uh, the money from Santa Rosa was just a one-time authorization. Um, hopefully we can count on um, being able to work on and develop that partnership so that 
continues um, until we can get a permanent space um, across the road in Roseland Village. So that's where I believe we're at. Ready, thank you. Um, the Standard Operating Procedures Ad Hoc Committee, a uh, Ann, <laughs> Karen. Whoever. Yeah. Um, we, um, we will, my, the report's in the packet, but we do have uh, a number of SOPs in draft, and we'll be meeting soon, um, now that everybody's back from our various travels, to uh, develop our work plan for the next phase. Thank you. Um, no report from the Foundation Commission ad hoc. Uh, the bylaws ad hoc. Tom? The report is in the uh, packet. If anybody has any comments on the uh, draft report that we have there about the uh, leases, we'd appreciate hearing that, all the three of us. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, Andy. Um, I just wanted to say, Tom, that I thought your suggestion about how to handle the leases was absolutely correct. I appreciated the direction you provided and want to su support you enthusiastically. Thank you. Yes, I also want to thank that committee. It's not an easy task running through boring leases and transactional language. So thank you to the committee for going through all that and suggesting, you know, kind of standard, regular language that hopefully would be inviting to all of our jurisdictions to kind of take a look at and have an open dialogue with. So yes, I also second your great approach to this and your hard work. Thank you. All righty, no report from the orientation and training. All day lab committee. Um, I think we're going to have a report later on. We are going to get back together. Well, there is some discussion that needs to go on. So that's what I can say at this point. And as far as the real estate committee, I want to thank Stephen Zolman and Tom Hauser for um, serving with me on that committee. Uh, we provided support and incidental help if it was needed, et cetera. And I am going to put that one to rest because we have signed the lease for the Roseland space, and there's no longer any need for us. So we got rid of one committee. Okay, so moving on to the consent calendar. Um, anybody have any comments or needs to withdraw? I'd like to pull the um, items. item on the magazines just briefly. For, I had a couple of questions. Otherwise, I move consent for the balance of the consent calendar. And which one was it? It would be um, uh, 9.2. Okay. So we're pulling 9.2. Move it down to discussion. Okay. Or move it to action, right? It goes to action. Excuse me. Okay, so for 9.1, 9.3, 9.4. I move uh, approval. Move? Yeah. Okay, so Dave Cahill moved. Who seconds? Second. I already moved, actually. I said I moved consent other than pulling them. Oh, just oh, technically. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Paul Heavenridge, that's okay. <laughs> Paul Heavenridge seconded. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those against? Passed unanimously. Okay, so we're down to the um, action items by motion. Okay, that is, we're gonna start with the election of officers for next term. I'm gonna get there in my book. So we're going to... um, as you know, we're trying to clarify procedures and make them much more equitable and smoother than they have been in the past. Um, so we, the SOP committee put together a nominating process. Um, we've stuck to it fairly closely. We did have one exception. We did extend the nomination time to the um, final date for packet entries uh, for this packet. So um, now we're down to the nominations. And because I'm chair and I'm involved, I'm going to turn it over to Jane Clickman, our uh, 
administrative um, assistant for the commission, and she is going to handle the, the process. Okay. <clears throat> Everyone has looked over the nominations for officers in your packets. Okay. Everyone has considered uh, the nominations for officers that are in your packet. Let me see that. Okay. And so next we will deal with the chair nomination, first of all. One nomination was submitted prior to the deadline for the position of chair. It was Reese Foxen. All those in favor of Reese Foxen for chair, please raise your hand. We have a count of nine. We need a quorum, and I think that meets the quorum. So Reese Foxen has been elected as chair of the commission for the term beginning August 1st, 2019, and ending July 31st, 2020. Congratulations. I think. Yeah. See, <laughs> I think. Uh, we will next deal with uh, nominations for vice chair. There were two nominations. Yes, Barbara. Yes, if I may um, make a comment. Um, I, I got the sense at the last uh, commission meeting that there was kind of a, an appetite for change, uh, bringing on some new folks. Uh, new people were nominated and withdrew. Um, and so I was a little bit surprised to find nomination back in the packet when I opened it up on Saturday, but nonetheless, um, I do wanna say that I'm going to withdraw my nomination in favor of Deborah Doyle to add a new uh, flavor to the leadership. Um, it's a slightly painful for me to do that, but I'm gonna do it anyway. And I'd like to say that this last year has been uh, very rewarding, uh, a ton of work. I've appreciated working closely with our chair, uh, I think in a much more close situation than we have had in the past. Uh, recently I made the decision to work very closely hand in hand, attend the uh, weekly meetings with our director. Um, I wanna say that uh, five years ago when I joined the commission, we were absolutely threadbare. Uh, it was a very serious and kind of desperate situation. We've come so far, those of us who worked on the measure uh, M and Measure Y campaigns to try to get the funding. I am very pleased with all the work that everybody collectively has done. Um, and I would say over the, a year ago today, uh, we didn't even have an interim director. Um, our problems had been in the past financial and uh, we kind of solved the financial problems with a few bumps in the road, but last year we didn't even have an interim director. So just within this past year, tremendous accomplishments. It was a great honor to work with Reese and with Susan Hildreth for six months and get a lot of things rolling, and it's been an honor working with Ann and getting to know her. So I wish everybody well, and I do withdraw my nomination for vice chair. Thank you. Barbara's withdrawal is noted. Uh, that leaves us with one nomination. All those in favor of Deborah Doyle for vice chair, please raise your hand. Okay. And that's unanimous. So Deborah Doyle is now the vice chair, elected vice chair for the term beginning August 1st, 2019 and ending July 31st, 2020. Thank you all for your participation. Andy? I'm not sure if this, if I can put this in the form of a motion, but if I can, I would like to uh, move that we express our gracious thanks and appreciation to Barbara for the outstanding job that she's done over the past year. Uh, it's been a pleasure working with you. Second. So all in favor? Aye. 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 All righty. Yes. I was going to say thank you to Barbara, too. She and I, as some of you may know, have had our differences, but we've always been able to work them through because we talk to each other and because 
we were trying to move in the same direction, and we were trying to move together. And through that, and through the talking, we succeeded. And I have appreciated her doing that with me, walking with me as we went through this. Thank you, Barbara, very much. All righty, moving on to the reimbursement policy. Um, this is the policy, not the procedure necessarily. So it's the policy uh, allotting monies to the commissioners to cover expenses for meetings and to cover uh, professional development. Uh, limited amounts, uh, fiscal impact will be $55,000 um, all told, and that was a rather generous kind of guessing. I used my driving as kind of a basis because I probably would drive more than anybody and have always driven more than anybody on the commission. So that's kind of how we came up with that. So do I hear a motion to accept? I, I so move. You so Seconded. Move? And who's the second? Stephen. Okay, so Paul moved and Stephen seconded. So all those in favor say aye. Well, aye. Aye. Oh, okay, Ask sorry. Questions and discussion. Yeah, sorry. So uh, to these the 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 amounts or the stipend, whatever it is, to receive it, you have to submit a um, um, a cost. A form. A form. Yeah, there is a form, and that's going to be coming next month in the uh, with the SOPs. For but we need costs for attending the meetings and yeah, driving, travel, meals. Uh, meals. If there's a meal involved, like when I go to Los Cien, my meal is paid for. Okay. Um, those are the kind of the general ones. And then if you go to a uh, conference, if you travel to and from the conference, lodging, uh, et cetera. We can also do professional materials. I've gotten a couple of books. Uh, I like books. Uh, we've gotten a couple of books uh, or some other things that might help you, you know, figure things out. So that's what's involved in it. Um, FYI, it's a $2,000 limit for all the commissioners except the chair, and that's a $2,500 one. Yeah. So anything else? Any other questions? Okay. So it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those against? Okay. Policy adopted. And uh, um, we already have a... SOP in the works, so we'll have it up for you at the next meeting to look at. Okay, and approve the addition of Renee Norris to authorize signers on the library bank account. Anne? So previously the authorized signers were uh, Ken Neiman, myself, and Jamie Anderson. Uh, Ken is now gone. And we would like to add Renee Norris to the authorized signers. So moved. Second. Okay, Stephen uh, moved and David seconded. Quick discussion item. Yes. I see in here that um, our new CFO has the title of Administrative Services Division Manager and Chief Financial Officer. I wasn't aware that she had that, both those titles. I believe Ken did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm getting a nod down there from Jane, too. Mm -hmm. So because um, and all the other references we make to her, we call her our chief financial officer. Okay. You have a bigger title. Thank you. Okay. So any other questions or clarifications? Okay. So it's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, say aye. 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 And all those against? Passed unanimously. Okay, so we're into the discussion items. The director's report. Excuse me, are we going to deal with number 9.2? Oh. Oh, 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 sorry. Thank you. Okay, Barbara, you pulled 9.2. You had some questions or something about them? 
Yeah, as soon as I can find. Okay. Uh, just a couple of quick questions about this. Uh, do the branch managers select the magazines? I, on the invoice, it looked like they all go to headquarters, and then at the end, there were some like individual branches that seemed to get some other ones. I was just kind of wondering about the distribution to the branches, how that happens, whether there's just like one copy that we get with the subscription and how they get sorted out, and then whether the branch managers have a fund and they get to buy some more. Sure. I understand the questions. Um, so the branch managers do choose the titles that they want for their branch. Um, so they select the subscriptions each year they want to either keep or add new ones or drop. Um, the reason most of them are bundled coming to headquarters is because we have a centralized check-in that happens there. So they do all come to headquarters. The exception to that are the newspapers. Those get delivered directly to the branches each morning through their book drops, so they have them ASAP for the day. And that's why you see the, the shorter, more itemized invoices at the very end of the large document that have the individual library addresses associated with them. So, for example, if um, Air and Space Smithsonian, you get, we get two of those, and I don't understand the, the additional like the additional invoices at the back for the individual libraries. So those are on top of the numerous quality quantities. Right, that so, we so the, the one you just mentioned, Air and Space, that two of our branches get that. I don't know offhand which two. I'd have to look. Yeah. Um, but if, if it's a newspaper, that's going directly to the branch. Oh, I see. So all those ones that are directly, those are all newspapers. Correct. That's the difference. Okay, got it. Thank you. Sure. Andy? Jamie, I have, I have, a, I have a question. This is, this is an enormous list of publications. How should we as commissioners assess this in any meaningful way? Um, you is, shouldn't. is this a package deal? <laughs> Was this built from the ground up with individual requests from branch managers? How did we end up with this list? And is there any way of determining to what extent people actually uh, need these publications as opposed to others? So it's being brought to you as, as, as a financial action item because of your purchasing policy. Um, it's not being brought for comments regarding the content. So all of the staff at the branches have determined which, which titles that they want. So it is built from the ground up by specific request? Yes. As opposed, okay, that's fine. That's all I wanted to know. Thank you. Wait a minute. Tom, you had a comment? Um, it's even lower down because in Sonoma, the Friends of the Library and the Library Advisory Board always review that, and if they want something extra, there's consideration of that every year. Jason? I just wanted to say that's a, that's a staff decision. And I don't want, I don't think it's the boards to get down to what magazine uh, individual branch it receives or doesn't receive. I, I just don't think that's a commission's decision. I don't want to go down to that detail. I, I was assuming that Andy, uh, Andy was asking for the process more than the, more than the specifics. I know. I, I do have what I think is a related question, which is um, how long has it been since we've reviewed the, the threshold, I don't know who sets the threshold that makes it 50,000, um, but I wondered, has it been a long time and last year? Okay. Okay, thanks. Any others? Okay, then uh, do I hear a motion? Uh, so I move. Okay, Jason moved, second. Andy was a second. All those in favor of passing uh, consent? Aye. <laughs> and all those against? Okay. So now we can do the director's report. Okay, it's been uh, another joyfully busy month. Lots of wonderful things going on in the library world. Uh, one of the real highlights for me, uh, Renee and I had a chance to attend the State of the North Bay Conference, and the keynote speaker was Dr. Micah Weinberg, who is the CEO 
of Sonoma Forward, uh, California Forward. Um, his talk was really interesting, and he focused a lot on changes within the community. For example, in Sonoma County, the high cost of living, the lack of affordable housing, the environmental challenges, and the aging of the population are things that not only the library, but all government institutions, businesses, nonprofits, we all have to keep those trends in mind when we're setting our goals for the future. Uh, so I think as we're going into our strategic planning process, this is a great time to have this kind of information, and it will serve us really well. So um, I'm looking forward to the process. Okay. Um, the monthly financial reports, I believe, are next. Okay. This is the report for May 2019. Excuse me. Could you yes. bring your microphone very close to your mouth? Very please? close. Yes. Can you hear me now? You can hear? Okay. This is the report for May 2019. Um, the cash balance for the general fund was down from April to $12.6 million. And the cash balance from the sales, uh, sales tax was uh, almost the same at $9.367 million, so almost the same on that. Um, the year-to-date revenue is 32.7, and the year-to-date expenses were 26.3. That leaves 6.4 million revenue over expenses year-to-date through May. Currently, the library is 92% through the fiscal year. The final entries that will happen there are actually happening on July, excuse me, sorry, on July 18th, so we should have year and financial shortly after that. The tax revenue um, that we've received to date has been 31.3 million, and that is 5.38% million, or 5.38% over the budget amount of May. And the two primary property tax payments that we received uh, in December and April were received, but we also received our final tax payments June 10th. Um, the first amount was 279000 for the property tax, the main property tax, and then we also received a supplemental property tax in the amount of 39000 And our fund balance as of May 31st was $28.5 million. That's down from $29.9 million at the end of April. Our purchasing amounts that exceed over 25,000. Uh, the largest amount is Baker and Taylor, which is our book and materials, which we would expect. Um, but I did want to also notice, uh, note that our Burke, Burke Williams and Sorensen total for the month was 54,000. I was asked at the finance committee about how much our labor negotiations cost, and our estimate is about 125,000. Are there any further questions? Okay. Any? Yeah, Karen. Um, I have a question under purchasing. Um, it says that Khalifa Group, a little over eighty-five thousand, was spent on broadband. That's right. So we were behind on a couple of invoices. So that it, that's our scenic bill oh, for the oh, year. It's literally broad, broadband. Yeah. Okay. Literally, right. little, yeah. literally our internet. Okay. Nice. Okay. Yeah. Any other Any other? questions? Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank Renee. you. Okay. Report on the all lab workshop. Ray. Now it's on. Good evening, Chair Foxen, Commissioners, Ray Holly, Community Relations. Um, I was asked to prepare this uh, for you, the reports in your packet. Um, be happy to answer any questions. Stephen. Yes, I was reading through um, the summary of action items, and I did not see the circulation of the Sebastopol lab manual 
as being one of the things that I remember there being a discussion and one of the facilitators writing on the board. And nor did I see it disclosed and disseminated to any of us as commissioners and then therefore by the chairs of the respective labs. Also, quite honestly, I'm completely confused by where we're at with this. It just sort of says that you and our director reviewed all of the recommendations from the full day that we all spent in that room and we were going to have somebody make decisions about when the second meeting would be, the third meeting would be, what the process is. It's like, I, I have no idea where we're going with this. So do you, can you enlighten at least me? Sure. Um, now that I hear you mention it, I also recall the discussion of the circulation of the Sebastopol lab manual. And um, I can't recall whether it made it into the notes or not, but it's my bad for not sending it out. I'll send it out right away. As to next steps, um, that currently is outside the purview of the staff. So I would refer to the commission chair on that. Oh, well then I have a follow-up question. Then, then what, what, what process are we implementing to set the next dates? Uh, Sarah Lagos, who is chair of the committee that was planning this, and myself are going to meet with Ann and uh, Ray and resolve some of these issues because we walked away dis a little disturbed because some of those things had not been addressed by the facilitators. So we are going to uh, address them and take care of them. And so, we hopefully will be meeting the end of next week. And so by I'm requesting this as a future agenda item that we have a status of where we're at with that at the next commission meeting because I do not want to lose this. I can tell you straight up that I heard from a few people and I keep hearing from others specifically within the lab of like we keep going to these meetings and we keep having long discussions and drawing things yep. and then nothing ever happens with it. And I don't want to be the person when I show up at a lab meeting going, I still don't know the answer either. So thanks. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Stephen. Barbara? <laughs> I have been frustrated with the labs for years. I used to be on the lab, I used to be the chair of the lab. Everybody has these same confusing questions about what the labs are supposed to be doing. You, if you look at the bylaws that we have attached, almost all of them say the same thing. The purpose is to, quote, make recommendations. Make recommendations to the commission, library director, branch manager on all matters affecting public library service in the region. And I think we all know that just never happens. We never get any recommendations. It's not structured that way. What concerns me the most, and I agree with what Stephen's getting at, what concerns me the most is that we have, uh, I just received a consultant's report who looked at all of our organizations. And the, in the consultant's report, it said, we really needed to look at this issue about whether labs should continue. Labs are in uh, the JPA, as we know. Labs could be put on hiatus. Labs could be something. But I was really hoping that this would be a very focused, to the point, call the question, lab members, what do you think, uh, you know, is your is your duty, is it working, all that kind of stuff. And my fear was what happened, which was it became another kind of an exercise in kind of general consulting conversations and you know stuff. I've been through all lab days before as part of an all lab day before I got on the commission. So I agree with what you're saying. We need something really specific. We need to really specifically understand whether the labs, because they take an enormous amount of staff time, the branch managers call for the agenda, the branch managers do the meetings, the branch managers do the minutes, they gather all the material. Many, many times there's no quorum. Many, many times there's difficulty getting lab members, and it's because it's so vague. And last year, when our uh, our chair, Tim May, a former chair, went off the commission. He was going to head up a little committee that was going to deal with this, and I don't think Tim's ever was ever able to do that. So that's why we kind of relying on that consultant report. So anyway, I, I too, I was unable to go. I was at, in Utah at a high school graduation for my granddaughter, but I wanted to be there to kind of push this process forward. And I'm concerned that if we just have two more kind of general meetings, we're just not going to get at the well, crux of the issue, really call the question. So 
I don't know whether I should be involved in any meetings or whatever. I'm kind of pontificating a little bit, I realize, but I, it's just been an issue of so much frustration to me. I've been involved in the Friends and the Lab. I, uh, somebody, uh, when we had that uh, Friends training I went to, uh, I think there's an opportunity for the outreach portion of what the labs, some of the labs have been doing, certainly to be part of the Friends. To, to do that. I don't know that there is, because of the way our organization came together, our library system came together, and they, all the, the individual libraries had their individual boards, and so the reason the labs were presented or were maintained was so those individual boards still had something to do and something to say. But that is no longer really the case. And um, so anyway, I would like to see something really focused and, 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 and some real um, conversation about uh, whether the the labs could be put on hiatus, some or all, and some of the functions picked up by the friends. Anyway, some real uh, specifics. Thank you. Well, that that oh, go ahead, David. I share Barbara's concerns. Um, there have been repeated failures to have quorums or quora at a variety of labs, and of course, under our bylaws, you can't even discuss stuff without a quorum. Those meetings are improperly constituted, should not be held. Second, um, they never perform their function. As Barbara pointed out, we never get any recommendations from the labs. So they're not performing their functions, they're not meeting properly, and I am just uh, think that the whole thing is just not worth it. Anybody else, Stephen? Uh, I, I just don't want our lab members who may be watching this tape to feel that everything has gone to in a handbasket, because that's not really true. There are some labs that are excited. They might be needing a little bit of help and guidance, but they are very, very dedicated. Maybe not all, but I don't want them to hear this and go, why even bother showing up? Because the commission doesn't care and respect them either. So I'll so put that out there. No, I agree with you, Stephen, and I agree with much of what has been said. Um, it did felt like it slid out of our control, and we didn't get what we wanted from that, and that's going to be the purpose. We're going to try and figure out how we can get what we need, what the labs need, and uh, yes, I want some answers. To Bruce? Don't, don't. Um, I want to say maybe Sonoma is Nirvana, but we always have a quorum, and we do get recommendations when I ask questions. And so I think part of the issue is that we need to anticipate things that are coming up on our agendas and say, what do you think about this? I've gotten a lot of strong input. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Okay. Well, first of all, I agree with, with Commissioner Zolman. I don't want anyone watching to think that their work is not valuable. I appreciate anyone who volunteers for the library, whether it be for the friends, through the lab. I appreciate everything that they do. I think we're talking about a structural problem that has gone on for many, many years. And I think that uh, Commissioner Hauser makes a good point. If we worked it backwards and we went from commission back to the labs and then it came forward, we have a whole lot of issues with that. In fact, the labs meeting on all different times and dates and to try to get that process going. But the process, even if we just got some answers on the process, I'd be happy. But it's just the vagueness and the uncertainty and the, and the gone on. But anyone, anyone watching, again, thank you for all the volunteering and the advocacy you do for the library. Everybody, I appreciate it. Anybody else? Yeah, we're going to get some answers and figure it out. That's my intention anyway. Okay, um, items for future commission meetings. Stephen. Yes, the one I just mentioned, having a report back from who's ever working with these facilitators and working with the labs to have concrete next steps and even proposed agenda for the next proposed date that we're all convening, because I'm not showing up unless I have a proposed agenda, which okay. I think a lot of us would also share. Second of all, I don't ever want to lose track with what our prior director, uh, Susan Hildreth, instructed us to do, which is to define our service districts. 
And I want to focus on that because, as I mentioned earlier, my municipality wants to entertain the concept of a bond. It may or may not go anywhere, but if it doesn't, then they want to be able to start brainstorming with every other city in this county to be able to do a county bond. What comes back to it is the fact that we don't know who we serve. I don't know where my service district is or region is for Sebastopol. And quite honestly, I'm not sure many of us know the region, the geographic region, and therefore the numbers of people that we serve. So I would like some type of discussion, a report. If it can't be arrived next month, two months, but sometime really soon on that issue. Reese? Yes. Okay, Dave. Um, I believe it was in the prior packet that the SOP committee made a recommendation on modifying the rules with regard to distribution of the packets. And I don't believe we ever approved that or that it ever got on our agenda for action. So I'd like to see that it was a good report. Um, like to act on it so we can put the new poli that new policy into effect. There are plans to have a couple of them on next time. Yeah. And that's one of them. Okay. Anybody else? Me? Oh, yeah. I said you were next. I know. That's all right. <laughs> I know. I'm too close to you here. Yeah. Um, I would like to have a discussion on the agenda about a board um, training. Mm -hmm. I, we've, we've kind of been pushing that back and pushing that back, and I know we've been waiting for SOPs. A year. And, yeah, <laughs> I've been waiting a year, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think it's... Um, very, very important for this commission to have a, a board training. Microphone. A board, I think it's very important to have a board training. And uh, I think we need to schedule it, and I think we need to have a, be a discussion item for the next uh, Okay. Board yeah, meeting. one of the things that Ann and I have been talking about in relation to this is we're trying to co coordinate the trainings mm -hmm. so that we all come out on the same page. Mm -hmm. And so, but... Yes, we're up to the place now where we can begin to make some Good. definitive things. Well, I think that in my, in my opinion, mm -hmm. I think this is the most important training, and all the other trainings are probably important, but this one has been put on the back burner. For a and year. I think for a year, and I think we desperately need it, and I think it should take priority. Yes, and I think it should be an organizational training, not a library training. That's my opinion. So, any other comments or any other items for the agenda? Okay. Everybody's quiet, so the next meeting is August 5th, and we are adjourned. <laughs>